Okay, everybody, good evening. It is uh, Monday, September 13th, and this is the Town of Rhinebeck regular town board meeting. Um, I think we're going to go slightly out of order tonight, and we had a couple of late. You have to do the pledge. Who said that? Josh. Josh. Uh, we don't have to, but we can, yes. Let's but do everybody it. like to join me for the pledge. I forgot. I know. Congratulations to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, the nation, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, first, we have a presentation tonight from Nate Nardi Saris from uh, New York uh, State DEC. And um, Mark Dixon, the chair of our, our conservation advisory board. Uh, they've been working really diligently on this Hudson River estuary program. Um, and they're going to give us a brief overview of their natural resource inventory. So thanks, Nate, for coming. Mark, thanks for coming. Nate, it's all you. I'll just give a quick introduction. You know, he's with the DEC, he's a conservation and land use specialist. And he's been working very hard with us and he's been instrumental in helping us with this NRI. Thanks, and, Mark. Uh, so I'll turn it over now to Nate. Thank you. All right, great. Thanks, Mark. Thanks for that introduction. And thank hey, you to Nate. you all. Thanks for Hi. <laughs> Glad thanks to hear, be here. Your... Yeah, it's been great seeing all the progress and um, you, you've, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Well, this is uh, this is what we do at the SRA program. So I'm, I'm always happy to help. Um, but yeah, then let me just get into it. I don't want to take up too much of your time, but we have a lot of exciting progress to talk about. Um, in case you need a little refresher or didn't know, uh, this NRI project is being uh, our program, um, the conservation and land use team at the Hudson River Estuary Program is helping to coordinate uh, this NRI project uh, by bringing in Cornell Cooperative Extension of Dutchess County. Uh, and they're bringing their mapping expertise to this project. Uh, we are bringing our coordination. Uh, our program uh, wrote uh, an, actually an, a guidebook on creating natural resources inventories. Uh, so we have a lot of experience doing this and we'd like to bring that to our local communities. Uh, and then of course, uh, all of the village volunteers, I mean the town and the village volunteers. Uh, this is actually an intermunicipal project. So we're working with uh, not only members of the environmental committee for the village of Rhinebeck, um, but also uh, volunteers from the town of Hyde Park, uh, which include both CAC members and uh, planning board members, as well as a couple other interesting, interested folks. Um, so, you know, it's a big group, uh, in addition to the Rhinebeck Conservation uh, Advisory Board or Conservation Board, um, but we're all working uh, together and we're, we're making great progress. So I'm happy to share that with you. Uh, I'm going to make this quick. I know we don't have a whole lot of time, but I'm going to just give you a little refresher on what a natural resources inventory is. I talk about some of our project goals, uh, a little bit of a timeline as to, you know, where we've come from, what we've accomplished, and when we're looking to finish up. We'll uh, definitely get an opportunity to look at some maps and then uh, talk a little bit about how your community might put one of these uh, inventories to work. Uh, so this is a, just a basic planning approach that our uh, program likes to uh, espouse when we talk to communities. Uh, I don't want to talk too much about our program, but basically what we do at the SRA program is provide education and technical assistance, uh, primarily to municipalities, but also land trusts and helping in, in planning for conservation. So uh, in that work, we've developed this really simple sort of framework, uh, starting with an inventory, you could use uh, that kind of fundamental inventory knowledge to uh, set your priorities for a community and then ultimately plan, protect, uh, and manage the natural resources that you have. But this whole process kind of revolves around this, this step of inventory, uh, which is really critical and, and ends up being the springboard for, for a lot of other exciting things. So a natural resources inventory really is just a combination of uh, all of the known resources for community, all of the, the known information on natural resources, bringing that into a single place. So instead of having a, you know, a report here on aquifers and a report here on, uh, on habitats, uh, we're, we're taking all of that information and we're putting it into one single document. And so that could be really useful for 
um, planning board, town board. Um, it, it, it can serve as kind of the fundamental planning document that the entire community can, can reference uh, as, as kind of a common set of facts. Uh, and so uh, what that ends up looking like in practice is a series of maps, uh, usually around 20 to 50 or so, uh, and they have width, uh, with and without parcels. So, you know, uh, th those with parcels can obviously be very useful on site level planning and those without tend to be more useful at townwide planning. And then there's a written description for each of those. So um, the maps are really informative and they're, they're very exciting to look at, but without some kind of written description, it's very difficult to interpret what's going on or, or you know, what some of the, the priority areas might be. And so uh, it's really critical to have that report component. It also acts as a place to kind of store those other reports I was talking about, say an aquifer study, uh, or in the case of the town of Rhinebeck, uh, your Hudsonia habitat map. So it acts as a home for all of those materials. Uh, so the goal of this project was to, you know, cultivate stewardship of resources, you know, so uh, again, this is the, uh, the, the foundation of, of subsequent planning and stewardship. Um, so it also informs design and review of new development. And again, is the foundation for plans and policies. So something like a comprehensive plan, um, which may be, uh, you know, something that a town board might be considering, uh, this can be uh, really uh, useful for that. And I'll talk about that a little bit more uh, at the end of the presentation. Okay, so our timeline uh, in March, 2021, the town passed, uh, uh, your board passed a resolution that allowed the conservation board to, to work with our program in, in Dutch CCE. So that's, we kicked off the project in May. And then during the summer, we spent kind of scoping what, what this project was gonna look like, what were the goals, how many maps, what data are gonna be shown. Uh, and then we started that draft mapping process. Uh, and now we're kind of getting into winter uh, or fall rather, I don't want to get ahead of myself. Uh, but then at this point, you know, we have kind of a solid set of maps already. Um, and at this point, we want to get revisions, get input um, first internally, kind of through uh, town boards, uh, but then ultimately from, from the public. And once those maps are kind of cemented and we have all that, you know, uh, really squared away, we're going to spend next spring into summer uh, bringing that information together. So really working on that narrative which at the end of the day, including maps, we're talking about a hundred page report uh, somewhere in that ballpark. Um, and so again, we're hoping to, by summer 2022, have a draft copy to circulate to your board and, and, and the general public for comment. Okay, so to the maps, which are the exciting part, this is the deliverable, right? We, we haven't finished the narrative yet, but we do have these wonderful maps. And so I'm gonna go over a few examples and talk a little bit about them just to maybe pique your interest and, and hopefully to get you to look at uh, the wider set of maps that are now available. Okay, so the first, we have these like set up by categories and let me go back really quick. So, you know, we, we have a, a, a section on climate, uh, physical setting, so that's things like geology uh, and, and topography, water resources, uh, which include things like aquifers and, and stream resources, habitats and wildlife, and a lot of this is, um, planning data uh, that revolves around rare species, but uh, in the case of Rhinebeck, you have a lot of unique information. And then land use, that, that's things like a kind of remotely sensed uh, land cover for the town, agricultural resources, those type of things. Um, and so as I get into each of these sections, the, map, the maps themselves are kind of in flux right now. We have uh, a, sort of a, an outline and target of which maps, but those are still kind of being refined at this point. But for this purposes, I displayed uh, the climate resilience map. This is a really interesting data set from the Nature Conservancy. And it's a little complicated, but the takeaway here is that the darker these green color, um, those are the habitats, the areas, the natural areas that are expected uh, to maintain high levels of diversity in plant and animal communities uh, in a changing climate. So for a variety of factors, these areas are uh, expected to host new species migrating from the south and to retain species that uh, are currently living on the site. So it gives you uh, some ideas. I see like Ferncliff Forest is, is an area that's considered to be kind of a hotspot. 
And then the area around kind of Fallsburg Creek here and Landsman Kill is also identified there. So this is just one uh, data set to help kind of prioritize planning for a future climate. Uh, next, we have physical setting maps. And of course, that includes some of your geology maps, steep slopes, uh, and topography and elevation. Uh, and steep slopes, I, I have that here. That can be really useful for especially the planning board when they're looking at site plans. This is um, pretty high resolution data that, that, that would give them an idea of if there are slopes that are in excess of 25% or uh, there's even a, there's a full ramp here. So everything from 5% to 25%. And of course you can zoom in on these maps and at the parcel level, that information is a lot more clear. But from the town level, you can see kind of the areas along the Hudson, those kind of clay uh, ravines that kind of go up here through the, uh, the Landsman's Kill. Um, uh, and then some of the higher elevation areas in town. Uh, next, this is some uh, water resources maps. And this is, a uh, I pulled out the aquifers map here. This is pretty unique data uh, from Dutchess County. I believe that county planning uh, worked with Cooperative Extension to put this together in the early 90s. But it shows areas uh, for uh, aquifer recharge um, that are important, uh, the major and sensitive aquifers in the town. And I will say that I've worked in other communities, uh, notably Beekman, which is a little bit, you know, to your southeast, uh, and they actually use this as the foundation for their aquifer protection law, this data set. So these data sets can be used um, to do something like an overlay district, which may be of interest during a future zoning update. Uh, this is an interesting map I included here for habitats and wildlife. Uh, and again, I'm not I'm not talking about all these maps down here, but in, this is all these are all separate maps with uh, separate resources shown on them. Uh, this is important biodiversity areas. So these are areas that uh, basically, if you go on the environmental resource map or if you have a project, which is the DEC uh, screening tool, if there's a rare species, there'll be a circle that's placed around that at a buffer. Let's say you know a thousand feet or so. Uh, in this case. You'll notice that uh, the, uh, the, the, the boundaries are not necessarily a circle, and that's because uh, they have a known rare species location. They put it into this computer model, and it basically took all the known habitat that that species would require and drew a smart boundary. So instead of just saying, you know, a thousand feet away from this location, we expect it could be here. We say, you know, uh, a, a rare frog was found in this wetland, and it's connected to all these other wetlands that it could be using but it doesn't include the, the more urbanized area or the more suburban area where there's no habitat. So it's a little bit more of a kind of targeted way at looking at where rare species are. And it breaks them out by, uh, you know, whether or not they're an important area for uh, terrestrial species, something like uh, a, a land turtle or rare species, something like maybe a, a frog or, or a rare bird. So it gives you some information in that category. And then last, we have land use here. Uh, this is an agricultural resources map. So it shows kind of the important farmland soils in the town, because of course, uh, Rhinebeck has a, a rich history in farming. And it also shows parcels that are receiving the county uh, uh, ag value assessment. So it's kind of a proxy for active farm use in the town. Uh, and again, it's a little easier to see when you have that map in front of you, uh, but you can see these kind of hash lines there it gives you an idea of where the major important agricultural centers are in the town. And maybe some areas that could be uh, conserved or protected or considered that maybe don't have agriculture now, but have really important soils that do support it. Okay, so I'm going to end this presentation uh, with a look at, at what might come down the road after this natural resources inventory is complete. Uh, and here, this is that example getting back to comprehensive planning and zoning updates. Uh, this is a great resource for, um, for a town that's looking to take on a project like this. So the example I have here, this is the town of Cornwall. On, uh, well, the village is Cornwall on Hudson, but the town is Cornwall. And they did a, con a comprehensive plan update in 2019, and they were concurrently working on their natural resources inventory. And they were actually able to use maps from their natural resources inventory in the comp plan uh, and I believe that was able to realize some cost reduction on that part because their comprehensive plan um, consultant didn't have to do quite as much mapping. Uh, things like, uh, again, going back to aquifers, um, but it's an important resource, they might map something like that in a comp plan 
update. Um, but um, but if the information's already there, uh, you're a step ahead. And so this is a map that they had included uh, that was uh, public wells, aquifers, and risk sites. And that went right into the plan. Uh, next, we have uh, just general planning for conservation. Things like open space plans, which are you know basically the the town's step-by-step uh, -step plan for for conserving land in their town. An open space inventory, which is a prioritization of parcels, or a community preservation plan, and that's something that the town of uh, uh, Red Hook to the north of you adopted some years ago, where they uh, they received authorization from the, the state government to. Uh, hold a referendum that ultimately got them uh, a, a real estate transfer tax. I don't remember what theirs is. It's between one and 2% uh, on all transactions. And that's funded a lot of conservation in it's the town. A, I think it's 2% over, it is 2%. The median, over the median sales price. So whatever the Correct. median sales price is, is exempt. So it's anything over than that. Yep, that's you got it. So you're obviously very uh, um, well aware of the community preservation plan. Um, but again, we've had other communities that we've worked with on these that have used their natural resources inventories to create a plan like this. When did um, Red Hook pass that? About ten years ago. Yeah, they had they had already had a bond measure, so there had been some planning done in in how they were going to spend that bond measure prior to the passing of the community preservation plan or fund rather. And I don't really remember, but I think you're on. I think it was something like 2009. I want to say uh, when that was first passed. Thank you. And this is just a really uh, cool uh, open space uh, plan map. Uh, this is from the city of Kingston, and they had completed an, a natural resources inventory that ultimately led to this. And it's just a really great way um, to you know get the community excited about conservation when you have a really dynamic kind of action-based map like this. So if you are interested in um, open space plan, I encourage you to look at the city of Kingston's um, because surprisingly, they do have quite a bit of resources, natural resources, even though they are uh, technically a city. OK, uh, the next uh, example is developing checklists. So uh, I have this checklist here, um, but this is something that's great for planning boards, but other committees who have to do some kind of environmental review or really any kind of review. Uh, everyone realizes the value of a checklist, um, but if that is something that you do want to develop, um, the natural resources inventory is an obvious starting point. If you can look at all the data that's there, then any board that requires an applicant to provide information can just provide the applicant with that checklist and the natural resources inventory. Um, this was one from some years ago that uh, your planning board was using. I don't really know what the status of that is at this point, but uh, again, it's a great model for, um, for using that NRI and planning going forward. And then finally, there's stewardship. I mean, this is especially pertinent for municipalities that manage uh, that manage their own parkland that has significant natural resources in it. And it really, the natural resource can, inventory can help define what resources might be on those properties. And in that way, it can help enhance the management because it can focus management on protecting those critical areas. Uh, so the example I have here, this is from a project we were working with the town of Unionvale, which you can see Beekman is just to the south of it. And this is their town park, it's Tymore Park. They're very proud of it. It's about 2000 acres or so. And so, you know, they have just finished their natural resources inventory and have started using it to help prioritize management within their park. So here you can see, this is a land use map. It just tells you these uh, yellow areas are their field areas and green is forests. And it kind of breaks out what's conifer forest and what's, what's uh, what's deciduous forest there. This is uh, another interesting piece of data. It's the forest condition index. I won't get into what that actually is, but it is a ranking uh, and prioritization of forests throughout the region. And so it helps them to see that this forest up here is of much greater value uh, at the regional scale than this one down here. And they're both within the park. So they really wanna concentrate uh, kind of re restoration activity and keeping trails away from sensitive areas in this northern part of the park because of this. And then this is another map looking at uh, uh, floodplains and uh, riparian areas, kind of the smaller floodplains around streams. Uh, this is a dam here uh, that, that's slated for removal. So it gives them an idea of, you know, maybe some, they might want to do some dam removals to help 
uh, migratory fish, get up above them, uh, or maybe they just want to do some planning and preparation for uh, a trail or road building that has to cross some of these floodplains. So you can find the easiest way to do that. And then finally, this is that steep slopes map, and it just tells you, you know, where the steepest areas are in places that are potentially sensitive to environmental degradation because of that. So again, this is the kind of analysis that, you know, a planning board would do for any parcel, but it can also be useful for the town uh, in their uh, stewardship and management of their own properties. And that's, that's all I had. I tried to run through that as fast as I can because <laughs> I know that you have a, a busy agenda today, but I do encourage you to visit uh, the Rhinebeck uh, project website uh, that I have here. And uh, Mark can circulate that link to you all again. Uh, and that, you know, look at the maps that are there. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, please uh, reach out to Mark and, uh, you know, send them our way. We're really interested um, in, you know, getting your feedback and having as many eyes on these maps before uh, we get them to publication. Um, Nate, it was a great presentation. We can, um, you know, send this link out in our, in our, um, web email blasts and put it on our website. Um, if you, you know, get it to the clerks, we'll take care of that. That sounds great. Um, Mark, uh, do you know, are the, are the current maps that Sean has up there? Uh, so, far, we, so far, we just have the base map. I don't think I have the updated uh, other resource maps that you gave me. Okay, well, what we'll do is we'll send those back to Sean. We'll make sure we get kind of a finalized set that we want to distribute to the public, and then maybe we'll circulate that to the yep. clerk to coordinate update. With, coordinate with, you know, Mark and I and the clerks, and we'll we'll get it out um, in any way that we're able to, because this is wonderful information. You know, we passed our comprehensive plan and updated zoning, I guess, almost 12, 13 years ago, and we're constantly looking at things, and this will be really invaluable for us. So thank you all for doing it. Thank Great. You. Yeah. Thank you all. I'm going to take off now. Good luck on Thanks, the Nate. rest of your uh, you. board proceedings. Okay. Bye-bye. Take care. Okie dokie. Um, I'm probably guessing that a lot of people are here for uh, this Brian Tam's presentation. So should we do that next? Sure. Yeah. Brian, Rebecca. Let me just uh, share our screen with you. <clears throat> okay, can you guys see that? Yep. Yes. yes. Okay, great. Um, in here, it references a um, petition, but I don't think we've received anything from you. We can certainly send that to you. Um, that would we be, have, yeah, that would be terrific. Just sure. to the clerks and town board. Sure. Not um, not yeah. just just so it's a we have it on record. Not of course. Yeah. Thank you. No problem. I mean, we uh we can email it right now. Yeah. Well, um, part of it is a uh, online petition, but we also have a scan of sign uh, physical signatures as well, um, because there were three petitions circulating at the same time. Whoa. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Two were started by local children. Um, so it was really great seeing them getting involved in the community, having that kind of engagement and taking that initiative. Um, so that was really nice to see. But um, yeah, that's mostly what the uh, physical signatures are. Great. <clears throat> um, so yeah, it's just, it's been. Uh... Do you guys want to put your video on or? Oh, sure. We can do that. Yeah, I think. Uh, On the bottom towards the left of your screen. Well, no, no, uh, sure. I don't know if you can stream a video inside of a video stream. Let's see. Oh, I see. Yeah. Well, well, wait. Um, Is this a wormhole, Nate, Fred? Nate if we can, do, do, Nate if we can is see doing your desktop, it. you can see your video. <laughs> Nate, Nate did it. Oh, no, I feel like this is a pop. -up. Okay, don't Hold worry on. about it. Don't stress. Let's just go through your presentation. There you go. Whoa. Oh, did that work? <laughs> yeah, you were there. And now I'm gone. <laughs> we're off to a great start here. No, don't worry about it, Rebecca. Just, I don't need to stress you out. Uh, yeah, I don't know how to do it now that we're okay. watching the screen. That's all right. Let's just um, look at your presentation. Okay. 
Well, um, my wife really helped put this together uh, and she's much better at uh, speaking cool. to uh, groups. Uh, is it okay if she, she kind of goes through this? Absolutely. Whoever you want. Yep. Okay. okay. Together, you. alone, whatever. <laughs> Uh, we really appreciate you guys taking the time to um, review this proposal we sent over. Um, there's really been a lot of community interest, it seems, in having this skate park added to um, our community. Uh, skateboarding has been around since the early 1900s, but um, there's been a real recent growth in popularity. Um, and with the debut at the Olympics, um, there's been huge growth. Um, locally as well as obviously um, all over the world but locally especially we're seeing a lot of people of all ages kids adults um, taking on that sport um, and not really having a place for them to practice a place for them to hone their skills a place for them to enjoy the sport safely um, it's you know all sports come with you know some kind of inherent risk um, baseball soccer football all of it um, skateboarding um, typically the most serious injuries are involving a vehicle and are on the road. So providing this space um, for skateboarders um, to practice in a safe area away from traffic um, is, is really something that it seems the community has been looking for. Um, it's not new. This has kind of been discussed, I think, for the last at least 10 years. But even having you know been born and raised here, my husband as well, you know, we've been talking about skate parks in this town since we were in, in yeah. school. Um, Where's so the this, nearest skate park, Rebecca? Um, there is one in Red Hook. They have a skate park set up. There's also one in Hyde Park. Yeah. And then across the river, um, Kingston is attempting to get a skateboard, skate park added. And Saugerties has a concrete skate park. The Gipsy oh. also. Yeah. 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 Um, so we kind of went through and looked at what some of the different options were um, for the skate park. Um, what we sent over, first of all, was a proposal of where it could be located. Um, there's a space between the tennis courts and the baseball field at the uh, Mazzarella uh, Rec Park. That is I'm sorry to interrupt. Is this, is this what is identified on our master plan? No. No, it's not. It's not. It's the, the area identified by the master plan is south of this. So why it, would we move, why would we move it? Because it's cheaper. This is it, this is utilizing that blacktop space uh, that's just has some dirt on it and some broken docks. Okay. Um, you know, I just asked because I think we would have to go through a site plan review and special use. Yeah, that, that's one of the asks here is what the actual process for approval okay. is because. Yeah. Okay. We, we were just talking about how, you know, how you guys are, everyone's putting the new fences up, like just trying to make the place look better. And there's this, you know, messy spot that could be turned into something right. easily right. and uh, fairly inexpensively. How uh, would it inter or how would it interact with baseball games when they were go going on? Well, I mean, it's a it's a separate area. It would be fenced, uh, most likely. Um, but this area is used by the the baseball people when they're doing baseball. How is it? No, I don't. Well, we're on little, we're Ryan, would you mind league. if I comment on that? Would you mind if I comment on that? Sure. Um, yeah. Can we wait until the end of the? Sure, go, go ahead. I was just going to answer it as a baseball family who plays on that field often. Oh, great. Um, I'm that, sorry, who's, spe who's speaking? My name is Lara Pendergast. Oh, hi, Lara. Thanks for coming. Thanks. Hi. Um, I just wanted to say to you, as someone who's always there watching the game right from that section, um, that behind that area that's in the view right now is never used ever. Um, and interestingly enough, if you look at the Red Hook skate park, it's actually right off of their baseball field as well. Um, there never seems to be any issue with it conflicting with the games. Um, you know, this little area now, it's not used at all. Okay. Well, I mean, it's just, you know, we it just, it's just a question. It's something we just, I was just wondering. Yeah. I just figured I'd let you know since Thank we use the field all the time, it's, I don't see it being any sort of a distraction. Thank you. The bleachers then aren't used? 
the bleachers are used, but you know, you're looking at a pretty large section there. I know the Red Hook Skate Park, if it's that wide, I would be surprised. Um, I don't think that there would be an issue with having the skate park fit there and still keeping the bleachers. Maybe I'm I mean, the, the bleachers could move on to the grass, just mm -hmm. like on the other side. They're, they're much closer. Yeah, um, you would probably be better off having them on the grass, actually, because then that um, you know, the announcer and the dugout won't be so much in your path, in your view path. Uh, keep going, Brian. Um, well, I mean, there was a, uh, the, when I joined the park committee, we, you know, we were looking at the space, uh, which is proposed in the original plan from however many years ago. Um, and which would be great and and there is the ability to do a large concrete park there but you know just looking at the park and just saying immediately oh we could make this place look so much better and be used that was kind of my my take on using that blacktop area got it so we were able to get um just a, a quick design from a ramp company that actually um constructed the red hook park i believe um, and this is, is something they prepared for us, um, what we would be, be able to do with a modular system. The great thing about the modular system is that if you were to decide at any point, hey, this is really being utilized, it's a huge asset for our community, we'd like to put a concrete park in, the modular park can be utilized, it would not become obsolete, it would just become a part of that concrete it, park. Yeah, it could be moved. It, it would become a part of the infrastructure of a concrete park? Yep. It, yeah, it can be. Wow. Absolutely. What, yeah. what are these topped with or faced with? Um, steel? These are made of steel. Um, there are some different options about what they can be topped with. This is a, a paint, I believe. They use some a type of coating called a max, max type. They also have something called steel armor. Um, which uh, ramp, armor. ramp armor, which which costs a bit more. Um, the initial estimate we got was for the base steel with just the coating. Um, <clears throat> which does have a 20 year warranty. Yeah, so talking in, to the different municipalities that um, have installed these skate parks, the overwhelmingly the feedback has been they require little to no maintenance. Um, there really isn't a lot involved in upkeep, you know, obviously, you know, cleaning, um, some touch up paint, um, but overwhelmingly, there really is no maintenance to these parks. Um, and Rebecca, these units all work as a sort of path, like you go clockwise or counterclockwise. Sure. This over here you can see is a half pipe. Right. Um, so you can use any one of these pieces, you know, a kid could just practice on one of these ramps at a time. But they, they interact with each here. other. Absolutely. Yeah, the one thing that a, a skate park company will design is try to make a flow. So when you're riding from one side, you go over, you know, and multiple, and, and obstacles. multiple obstacles. Yeah. Yeah. While creating still a flow of uh, traffic, let's say, um, so that it's not overly crowded and, and multiple people can utilize it at the same time. Okay, I'm sorry, I, I ask questions as I think of them. Um, the surface that's there, it's kind of like an item four or like a mm -hmm. gravelly thing, right? Would no, we, it's, it's, it's macadam, it's macadam. blacktop. Would we need to um, concrete that? Um, I mean, it's, that would be great, but it, it's not needed. Uh, Hyde Park has a modular park, very similar to this uh, on blacktop. Um, and it's nice and it hasn't, it's been there for 20 years and I was talking to the, the uh, park director over there and they've only had to replace two little things in 20 years. So we could have it resurfaced. We would have it resurfaced <laughs> before we put this. Yeah, I, I was thinking, you know, either the possibility of having it, you know, a seal coating um, or the, uh, it could be coated like the tennis courts with that tenant would be a sport coating. Um, <laughs> The main, or, or just blacktop, you know. the main requirement is that it's um, Flat. substantially level, um, making sure that it's not overly wavy because that can cause problems with the installation of the ramps. Um, but if they have to meet the ground. 
it, yeah. it has to be assessed because mm -hmm. yeah, is the scope might not just be putting these things in. We might have to seal coat or level a bit or something, but right. we're hoping it's a stable foundation to put this stuff on. Because surprisingly, that blacktop has been there for, I, I don't even remember, it's just been there for years. And uh, there's really only one major crack in it, yeah. which is surprising. And I wouldn't even call it major, really. It's just a, a small crack in the middle. Yeah. So whoever did it did a great job. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is the initial estimate. Again, this is just for um, this particular setup. Which is based on the size of that black top. Right. So it's based on the, the existing size that, 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 you know, we could make that work. This includes prevailing wage. So the price already includes that. Um, it includes installation. Um, I believe it does not include fencing. That would have to be performed or installed separately. That's not something the American Ramp Company does. But just to give us an idea of what this park would cost us, um, again, depending on what has to be done to the pad, um, to make it suitable for installation of the ramps and then, you know, additional fencing around it as well. And we also, um, we talked a little bit about the maintenance schedule, of course, already, you know, weekly, it's really just in inspecting the surfaces for foreign objects, brushing, you know, leaves and acorns off, whatever might be on there. Uh, monthly inspecting the hardware um, and quarterly touching up paint if necessary, but we're being told that really doesn't happen often. Right. Um, so just to give you an idea of what some of these parks look like, American Ramp Company was able to send us a few projects. Um, this one is in Los Angeles, California. Again, you can see these are the modular ramps they've installed. Um, there's great. some rails. Um, is this fenced and locked or is it open all night long mm -hmm. or? Well, I, I did talk to uh, everyone else. The uh, Saugerties put up, um, fencing to try and keep people on bikes off of it because um, they they had specifically made it for skateboarding sure sure um, and is that what we want to do we want it to be for skateboarding not bikes and i th i think with bikes you have to have very large ramps yeah you know um it would probably be better <clears throat> suited just kept to skateboarding possibly yeah rollerblading and... yeah rollerblades and stuff like that are you envisioning <laughs> wow. lighting as well well, there, there is, there is lighting there. There is a giant uh, double-headed thing pointing right at that, right on. Is that, that sufficient room. for <clears throat> the area? I, I or? don't, I don't know. Well, I, don't know. I mean, the, the park, park is closed is after dusk. Right? Yeah, the, the, the after the, there's no consideration at this point, in my view, about nighttime stuff. For this. Okay, <clears throat> right. Um, and and Hyde Park, they do have theirs fenced in. I asked if they did it a necessity and they just said, oh, we just did it because, you know, in case we needed to lock it. And they said they only have only locked it a couple of times in, in 20 years. Yeah. And they haven't had any uh, vandalism, like real, you know, they've had people, you know, painting and writing on stuff, but there's been no, no damage done, which is pretty cool. And their, their skate park is kind of tucked away, um, kind of away from the rest of the park where this would be kind of integrated with the rest of the park. So I don't think there's much as much of a concern about that. What is the area. gray structure at the left end of this? Uh... Here? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, it looks like that could possibly be concrete. Yeah. Put a skateboard know. onto it, I guess. Yeah, yeah, all of these would be, you know, although there is a lip there, so I'm not really yeah, sure that's how they I would. I was wondering what it, what, what it yeah. is. Um, this one was in uh, New Jersey, obviously much bigger in size, but just to give you an idea of what these modular ramps look like. And then the last photo, this is kind of where they've integrated these modular ramps into a concrete park. Um, so it's something that can be done after the fact uh, and you just install it into the concrete. So I think um, there has been a lot of support from the community, both from children, adults, locals, visitors. There's opportunities um, to add on to this park. It is modular, so it can be moved around. Um, you know, there's additional pump track, um, modular pump tracks you could put on for, for bikes. There's concrete. There's a lot of different options for down there. We're really just looking for some, you know, support and possibly to be included in the upcoming budget and find out from you what you need from us 
in order to be able to provide that support, what the next steps are? Well, I think um, this is an excellent uh, presentation. I know that you know it's in our master plan and we've been wanting to do it for a long time. We're entering into our budget session and we are prepared to put money into this for funding. You know, we've also got a big ask for the fields and we've got to um, redo some of the parking places, but we're ready to invest money into the park infrastructure. Um, we have to work on this as a um, board, but I do the tentative budget and present it to the board and then it becomes their budget. So I don't know, maybe we could have a brief meeting, you, Josh and I, while I prepare this part of the budget. Um, I had thought that the ask was about 60 or 70,000, which I, I was pretty sure we could do. I don't think we want to bond. Um, so I don't, I don't know. I don't know if we could do 120 all this year, but we should. Is there a possibility to do, to do fundraising in conjunction with it? Not, not us. Um, the town. No, but, no, I mean, but for we, us. If we were able to do no, no, absolutely. Just, it just prolongs it to some degree. So. Yeah. Uh, the, the, uh, are the 600 signatures all Rhinebeckians and all children or a mix of adults no. and children? It's a mix. It's um, a mix. I, I did, uh, I was able to uh, go through the the online ones and take out any, any you know, on un, not real, not real names and uh, any doubles and stuff like that. Um, the majority are from, the, the online ones only let you select, oh no, no, it does say where they're from. Um, most are, Ryan Beck, it's, but it's that a there mix. is a local, you know. We're, we're going to get to the official thing. Yeah. yeah, and the fig, the the yesterday alone was uh, eighty signatures by uh, Nabil uh, Jabari, who uh, went just around town all day and got and got people to sign, which is really impressive. Um, you know, we're as I said, ready to invest into the infrastructure of the park on our radar is, you know, redoing the pool and that whole pool area, getting the soccer field in, getting this in. Um, and we really have to see where we are and what we do and how we do it. I don't know, we can't do everything in one year. Yeah. And we can certainly start and open a capital project. And this is a decision that the board has to make together yep. sure. Sure. but we but i would like to meet with you during my phase of the um tentative budget preparation just to sit down and 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 tell you and i you know i have a schedule for the board which i have to go over of, of when i think i'll have the budget ready and when it has to be delivered so within the next week 10 days we should sit down and and come up with a with with a figure okay so I have a question. Has anybody looked at the possibility of grants either from the county or some of the local uh, funds that have been that are around? And when we built the pavilion, the town, I don't think, funded more than a third of the cost. The rest of it came from grants. Well, we got a um, block community block grant grant, but we don't meet the um, because it was handicap accessible, but we don't meet the income threshold for that. I believe Molinero is doing a uh, recreation playground grant. Um, has anybody heard of that one? No. I could look into that, Brian and Rebecca, if you'd like. I know that he does several. He does several each year. Well, this is like something we can look in as we're funding it, and the town we will put some money towards this. Whether it's one hundred and twenty thousand this year, I don't know, but it could be within sure. two years. Okay, great. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Thank we you all so much. That. No, this looks beautiful and it would be good for the kids. I know it's been on the wish list for a long time. So um, Rebecca and um, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll set up a date to go over this so we know what we're targeting for the budget. Does that sound okay? Yeah, great. That sounds wonderful. Thank yeah, you so thank, much. Thank you for all of your enthusiasm and thank you everybody for coming and supporting this. Um, you know, oh, one thing I want to speak to is just the process. 
because this park is on our master plan in another place, we really have to talk to um, Melody Moore, our, our planning board chair, uh, and find out what the process is for moving it and whether that's a, whether, oh yeah, if we can. Right. I'll talk to Melody. That That's one of my things, like, I don't know. Yeah, I'll do that. Yeah, it, it, it the, the master plan is all, um, it's been approved. It's it's it can be changed, but we'd have to change it. Yeah, got it. Thank you. You know, and do we want to do that, or do we want to spend the money to put the park where it's supposed to be? And what are the pros and cons of doing that? Yeah, I mean, we could definitely help uh, getting, you know, uh, well, the, I did talk to the same company about their designs, and they they do do they will come to your town do a design, do all the proposals. Um, I know it's about $7,500 for, uh, for the yeah, design it, fee. It, there might just be a reason why it's better to keep it where it's planned originally that I don't know yeah. about, you know, I yeah. don't know. Need to get in the weeds. Yeah, but this oh. is beautiful and it's exciting and I love that it's modular. So thank you for all your work. All right, thank, um, you. thank you. Ed, Chauncey, Alan, Josh, you guys have any questions or comments? Or? No, thank you for your time. Well, thank you. Oh, that's good. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Okay. Um, what next? Yeah, where am I? Uh, okay. Um, changes to the town of Rhinebeck zoning laws relating to solar electrical power generation as a discussion item. Alan, that's you. And you're on mute. I was really brilliant before I turned this on. I know, I know. <laughs> um, so uh, current zoning laws for solar limit the size of the array to roughly under a hundred uh, million watts, a megawatt. And uh, one of the problems with uh, trying to deal with community solar, that is to say an operation where where uh, residents of the town could buy into a solar array that's in a centralized place. One of the problems with it is that the megawatt is way too small for, to be viable because there's a lot of overhead in creating a solar park. But Alan, what, that limit is based on what? Transmissibility or? It was based on just square feet. Um, the, the, the problem is that in order to do a viable community solar program, you need at least five megawatts. It takes roughly 25 acres to do that. The acreage coverage would be roughly 20%. If you take the setbacks away, the, the solar array might take up 40% of the remaining area. But, uh, so in terms of the, the, the current zoning law, the density wouldn't be any, any different. It would just be bigger. In other words, we're allowing for, for a, in effect, a five acre, one megawatt uh, program. And what, this, what, what, what I'm gonna be proposing is to in, increase that by a factor of five so that we can have a viable capability, a financially viable uh, program. One of the problems, just so you'll know, is trying to get access to the grid. And in the town, there are relatively few places where you can get access that's adequate to the, to, to the uh, power that's needed. You just can't hook up anywhere. So, and, and, and Hooking up is expensive as well. So there's a lot of fixed costs when you do community solar. And the, as I said, the five megawatts is about the minimum that would be viable given all the fixed costs. So I know that, you know, one of the reasons we wanted to look at this was because our whole um, plan for um, community choice aggregate sort of became untenable when the rates shot up um, and we didn't want to commit any of our residents to spending more money and we are committed to 
you know, reducing our, our reliance on fossil fuel here. And, you know, New York State is pushing us towards that, and I'm happy for that. So this would allow us to generate more community solar power in Rhinebeck. And yeah. you, you believe, you know, when we di originally did this law, we were cognizant, we wanted, I guess, micro um, grids because we, we didn't want uh, big solar covering things. We got a lot of pushback from neighbors who didn't want it in their backyard. We had a lawsuit, as a matter of fact, uh, even though it wouldn't be visible. But now this will give us a little bit more flexibility and how big they are and how they're sited. And do you believe we can still do something like this within the guidance, you know, the guidance of our, our comprehensive plan of preserving our, you know, yeah. landscape and, and yeah, generate. All the, yeah, all the rules about uh, uh, clearance and uh, setbacks and visibility and, and so on all still apply. All, the, all this does is it, it increases the, the possible capacity so that uh, a developer would be more inclined to come along and propose something. And we have a, a I know we had a, just for the public, um, I think it was Alan and I had a telephone call um, several months ago with um, Victor Narkai from uh, um, Hudson, I'm sorry, Central Hudson. Yeah. And we went over where all the points are in the town that we could feed feed solar back into the grid. And um, we had a consultant help us with that. Would he help us with this law, Dan? You're asking? Yeah. Who are you asking me? You, yeah, you. I thought you said Dan. No, <laughs> the consultant was Dan. Okay. Oh. Sorry, I was, waiting, I was waiting for Dan to say something. <laughs> sure, yeah, we, I, I, th I think actually, if we if we pass if we change the zoning laws, the next thing that should happen is we should we should entertain developers who want to try to do it and let them you know let them figure out where. Yeah, but we have to revise the zoning before we do that. Yes. Right. Yes. All right. So we should get our planner involved and. Yes. Right. Yeah, I uh, think the, I think trying to figure out where to hook up is uh, premature at this point. No, I'm just saying we have to be cognizant of that when we're writing the law because okay. that's one of the that's one of the big limitations of what we've done with our law. Yeah, I mean, based on the little bit of looking that I did, there are a lot of sites that are not viable because they don't have access to the right capacity. Right. Uh, that's what I. Yeah. Um, Thank you, Alan. Do you have anything else or? Oh, I just want to say what the next step is. I'm going to create some proposed changes to the zoning law. I'll work with Jim and uh, Warren and, uh, and then bring it back to the town board. Terrific. Thank you. Uh, Josh or Chauncey or Ed, do you have any questions or comments? I was wondering how much acreage did you say it's needed for five megawatts? For five, um, five megawatts takes 25 acres. Okay. We, and, that's uh, and the panel area to the ground area is less than 20%. So there's, so that 25 acres includes setbacks, includes, you know, space between the, the rows of the array. So you can get a mower in there, includes, uh, you know, the transformers and, uh, and so on. So aren't it's, we going to have, aren't we going to have sheep and goats in there instead of mowers? Sure, why not? Thanks for doing this. I know we, we said we wanted to do this in light of our community choice aggregate going bottoms up. It's yes. just um, so. Yeah, hopefully this will attract some proposals. That was it, that really from my thank point. Thank you. Of is it is it fair to infer from this discussion that there is at least a possibility of financial feasibility? with regard to the cost of getting power to the grid. Because when Ed and I were looking at something along these lines several years ago, the awesome. costs were just crushing. Like a million dollars. Was it a million or three million? To get, 
But you mean to put, new, to, to put station. new infrastructure and to feed into the grid? Yes. Yeah, but that's why we're doing this so that we could allow um, bigger arrays to be sited where natural, where they can naturally tr already tie in. But, but, but beyond that, at some point, there's a pricing. It makes sense if you have a 25 acre lot that you can have you can put the pipe from one point to the other that was the other point of it there's a price viability related to the new farm to actually put the line to the to the um substation right like we looked at our old landfill and there's no infrastructure there so we couldn't feed anything into a grid so it became untenable so yes yeah. to your point chauncey yeah. Yes, that's valid. Well, I mean, what, what this does is it, it creates the possibility and we'll see what the practical part of it is once uh, we open up the possibility. Okay, right. thank you. Thank you, everybody. Uh, anything else? Okay, I'm gonna go on to my resolutions. Um, I need a motion for resolution 2021-187 for the option of surplus highway equipment. Motion. Thank you, Alan. May I have a second? I can. Is that Ed? Yeah. Ed. Thank you. Is there any discussion or any questions? No. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes unanimously. I will make a motion for resolution 2021-188 for our preliminary accounts payable abstracts, uh, 45 checks totaling $38,751.75. May I have a second? Second. Thank you, Chauncey. Uh, are there any questions or any comments? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? <clears throat> Passes unanimously. Um, I need a motion for resolution 2021-189, temporary closing town hall to the public on Fridays. Motion. Thank you, Josh. May I have a second? Again. Thank you. Are there any um, questions or comments? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? So moved. Um, the last item tonight, uh, is a resolution authorizing the town supervisor to execute uh, a restated and amendment agreement with Rugi's Village Holdings LLC at all. This did not make our agenda. Uh, we redid our agenda and put it on. And um, is this something we're ready to bring to the floor? May yes. I have a motion? Yes, don't so move. Thank you, Chauncey. May I have a second? Second. Thank you, Ed. Um, is there any discussion or any questions? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes unanimously. Great. Uh, thank you. Are there any new um, uh, any new business before the town board? Nope. Is there any public comment on any non-agenda item? Anything that anyone from the town board would like to bring up or say? Oh, oh, geez. I'm glad I took a long time because I, I wanted to bring up our our um meet our budget schedule. So uh let me just pull this up. Um 2022 budget schedule. I have to have my tentative budget to the clerk by uh, Thursday, September 30th, but I am going to aim to do that on Monday the 27th, which is a regularly town board uh, scheduled meeting. Um, if I don't do it then, I will at that meeting reschedule, uh, reschedule this, um, give it to the clerk on September 30th and reschedule a special town board meeting on October 5th. So please hold, October 5th for a special town board meeting and we could do it on any day because I think the only item would be the laying down of, of, of the budgets. If I don't have it to you by the 27th, which I am aiming to do. I would like to schedule uh, one, two, three, four, five, six workshops in October on Tuesday, October 5th, 
Thursday, October 7th, Tuesday, October 12th, Thursday, October 14th, Tuesday, October 19th, and Thursday, October 21st. Is everybody able to hold, uh, say, uh, 1 to 1 p.m. on those days? Run through yeah. the dates one more time, would you please? Yes, the 5th, the 7th, the 12th, the 14th, the 19th, and the 21st. 5th, 7th, 12th, 19th. 14th. 19 and 21. Yeah, it's every 14, Tuesday. 19 and 21. I don't anticipate needing six budget meetings, but I wanted to notice the public now and get them in your schedule for 1 p.m. Does that work? Yeah. It would have, you have any idea how long they'll last? No. No. no it's it's kind of up to you guys. I know. Because it becomes your your budget, but I'll I'll try. We've done well in the past, and you know we have we're going to commit a lot of money to capital projects this year, so hopefully it'll be tight enough before. We, that. And we would plan all of those meetings to be at one o'clock. I think so. Yes. Is that work yeah. for everybody? Work. Yeah, yeah, one o'clock. Yeah. Uh, and the reason being is that's when our staff is in town hall and Shelley, our bookkeeper. Um, great. Okay. So Joni, you can publicly. This is a public notice of those meetings. We're going to do them in person. No, no, we will do it via Zoom. Okay. We will do it via live broadcast on, on Zoom. Um, and then we have to adopt the budget by, uh, I don't know, uh, October 13th or 15th, I think. I'd like to adopt it on Monday, October 25th. But if we're not ready for that, I will at that regular town board meeting, uh, we, we're gonna get tentatively schedule our public hearing for Monday, October 25th with a possible adoption. And if we need a backup day, we will adopt it uh, on Monday, November 8th. Okay. okay. All right, sound good? Yep. Great. I got something. Okay. Josh, you have something regarding the tennis courts area? The no, I, I, I don't have it assembled, and I, I don't. All right. Great. I, um, any other I, discussion? Yeah, I don't, let me just have a sentence. I uh, sent an email to everybody right at the beginning of the meeting about the live streaming protocols for these meetings. Mm -hmm. I would appreciate your taking a look at them. Uh, and if you have any comments, get back to me. Um, why? That's how we've been doing it. Why wouldn't we continue to do it like that? Because it's because it's redundant and it's and it takes a lot of effort to do. And, and why have we been doing it? This is government. <laughs> well, shouldn't we be redundant? No. It's, is there... it's, it's, it's unnecessary. I mean, first of all, we don't think anybody's using it. Okay, so, all right. Okay, let me explain. There are two no, you, ways today. You, you explained it, I think, in your letter. Yeah. I was going to um, the public if anybody used will you, it. Will you please call um, Lori Mithen at the Association of Towns and ask her? Sure. She's counsel well, there. Lori oh, Mithen. Yeah, she has a hyphenated last name because she's married, but she may be able to steer, steer you towards um, somebody in uh, the um, Department of State. Uh, okay, open, so I won't know. have to bother Warren. Okay. Yeah. That makes yeah. sense? Yes, it, it would make life substantially simpler if we could get rid of the second way. To... Yeah, I just don't want to limit the public's access. That's the only thing. Yeah. Um, okay, um, any other business before the board? Okay, hearing none, I'll make a motion to adjourn. Second. Thanks. Good night, everybody. Good night.